We just got done watching Jack Flyter, mixed bag, if you want. Uh, I saw game score, which is not something I see often, but it was a very low game score. The line score does not look good, but there were some things that you can take away from his Major League debut. Tanner Houck, is it Greg Houck or is it Tanner Maddox? I have no idea. Pete Fairbanks had a hilarious comment after he really stunk it up, um, and he was the first to admit it. Tristan McKenzie is going through... Um, a health thing that I don't think we were entirely aware of, but should be something we talk about. And then you found some interesting win projections, Peter, that we're going to go through. Also have hot hitters in games of the weekend loaded Friday on the Just Baseball Show. It's Friday, April 19th. Peter Apple, just do the read. It's brought to you by BetMGM. Of course, it is the king of sports books. All you got to do. We're going to download the BetMGM app. We're going to deposit. But first, we're going to be using code just baseball. Why? You get a first bet offer, paid back in bonus bets up to 1500. Why wouldn't you? Well, if you don't like to gamble, that's fine, but if you do, it's an absolute no-brainer. Make sure to use code just baseball on BetMGM. Gambling problem? Call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. Must be 21 or older and terms and conditions apply. Arm, <laughs> a lot to dive into on the Jack Lighter front. And I know that yeah. you guys hit it at the beginning of the mailbag because it was awesome that he got called up. And that first inning looked great. And it was just a weird overall game uh, on Thursday afternoon in Detroit. And Leiter left in a 7-7 game in the fourth inning. And um, you sent me a text. It was like things could have looked a lot different had Leody Tavares not stopped at the edge of the warning track. That was a very weird one. But um, overall, I want to just start with you. Like, what are you taking away? from Jack Leiter's first major league start because a lot of people are going to look at the line score and say, man, that really stunk. And it wasn't good. It was with three and two thirds, eight hits, I think seven earned. He walked yeah. three. Was, so yeah. it, Wait a minute. A, was all, sorry to cut you off. Was, was all seven earned because no way all seven were earned. Leody Tavares made a little league ass play and just completely dropped it. No, no errors. Seven earned. To hit, he didn't that's not drop fair. it. He didn't, he didn't touch, touch it. it. True, he didn't touch it. That's a good point. So that's yeah, why it's not an error. It was a triple. But are what are you taking away from this major league debut for a guy that you've been following very closely for a very long time? Yeah, I mean, it was it was tough because the first inning he comes out and you're like, whoa, um, and then the second inning, you know, was kind of that welcome to the majors moment where he makes a couple good pitches or pitches that at least you'd expect not to get crushed on, and uh, you know, slider that was like three inches off the plate looper into right field because Gio Urshela can get his bat to a lot of different pitches. And then there was that three, two fastball to Riley green. That was legitimately a ball down and in, obviously you don't want to leave it there to lefties, but it was a ball down and in absolutely crushes it. Uh, so, you know, I think it was just a little bit of like realizing, Hey, you know, I can't get away with working from behind as much uh, in the big leagues. And and he, the thing that was making him so good in triple A is, you know, he wasn't working from behind nearly as much as what we'd seen in the past. We know that the fastball is really good. And and there was still plenty of swings and misses that he was able to to pick up. Like he picked up 10 whiffs and he actually flashed some good changeups. What I really saw though, is, is a guy that was juiced up. Like you could see the adrenaline. Um, I think you could really see when he got back out there for the second, like really, I, I think, I think I, I was surprised he was able to handle it in the first, but then in the second, I think you really started to see the, the adrenaline take over. And uh, I, I felt like he was choking a lot of sliders, uh, just kind of overthrowing them. And the thing with Jack is like the curveball and the change up and the cutter, like those are pitches that are complimentary that he's going to try to mix in whichever one of those are working for him. He'll mix in as a third pitch. But if the slider is not there, he ends up having to be fastball heavy and the fastball is really good. But when you know it's coming, you can, you know, cheat a little bit more and clip it. And I think I felt like that was kind of what happened was that slider has been with there for been there for him all season so far, all three starts and throughout spring training. And it just wasn't there today. Ends up having to lean more on the fastball. And honestly, it was the best offensive performance I've seen from the Tigers in terms of just the ABs they were putting together. Uh, but when the slider's not there, man, like he had to throw a fastball to Javi Baez, that turns into a double. You should never throw that guy a fastball. Like it just, he ended up having to lean back into that fastball too much. Um, and that slider had been there for him all, all season. Like I said, 70% strike rate before. So uh, I think he'll bounce back. And he really battled. Third inning was great. Fourth inning was looked like he was cruising. And he would have been through four innings if, Leody Tavares didn't uh, let that ball drop behind him. Um, and it would have been a little bit of a different line score. Not great, but four runs and four innings and all of those runs coming in one of the innings versus three and two thirds, seven runs, uh, I think looks a, a lot different. 
you, you feel way better going into your second big league start with a nine ERA than you do a 17 ERA. Mm-hmm. And I know that it's three and two thirds innings versus four innings, but at the end of the day, like, you know, you got to sit with that number for four days between yep. starts. And you know, it is a thing that like, Hey, the game notes are passed out. It says you have a 17 ERA. And then you go on the MLB at bat app and you see that this guy has a 17 ERA. It's one of those numbers that you really can't escape and it sucks. But like, this is one of those that I don't want to say is like entirely misleading because yeah, he didn't have a slider in his major league debut and he was trying to find his slider and it's hard to do against any major league team. And I like that you mentioned it was the best day for the Tigers this year. That's been a very underwhelming offense so far this year based on the elevated expectations that we had for the Tigers coming into this year. But shit, man, like Spencer Torkelson, Riley Green, Kerry Carpenter in the same lineup. They're going to come alive at some point, and they just happened to come alive against a guy that was, you know, like struggling to find his best yeah. version of himself in his first major league game. Yeah. Just a classic rookie debut on the road. Like, it's tough, mm-hmm. right? You make your first start in major right. leagues on the road during the day, right, against the Tigers offense that had been slow. But, you know, they're still all major leaguers, right? Watching Riley Green take those at-bats, like, they're a very similar age. It just looked like Riley Green has been seasoned much more than Jack Leiter. I'm not putting a ton of stock into it. Like I said, the seven and runs, it wasn't truly seven and runs because Leo Di Tavares catches that. Also in the second inning, you could just tell that it got away from him quickly. Arm, you were talking about that adrenaline. It had to at least peak at such high levels, especially when you have a walk on a couple of close calls too, then it's a bloop single. And then you're like, all right, I have to throw a strike. You throw a fastball, then it's a double. And then it just unravels. That's just what can happen to a rookie. Jack Leiter makes a ton of more starts, collects himself more. And then maybe that double is not a double anymore because he makes the right pitch and then gets out of the inning in the, in the future, because we saw how good the stuff is. The changeup was disgusting. The slider, when he was able to get it in, looked like a good pitch couldn't agree with you more he was just choking it and then when you have to compensate for a fastball in a fastball count when a major league hitter knows it's coming and you have to throw it in the strike zone it's not 100 miles an hour yeah. like it's that's what's it was going to happen it was yeah. 98 but there was a couple of 94s right in 93s and 95s because he had to get it right in the zone when he was fully confident in himself that's when we saw 98 so I saw the velo drop in some situations just felt like it got away from him and then when the defense doesn't help you out it's a major league lineup that can get to you so I I personally don't put a ton of stock into that start I thought there was a lot of flashes of great things that are going we're going to see in the future last time I uh we were gassing up a guy making his debut um I was like he's gonna come up make an impact that fastball is gonna really help it was Brian Wu, and he got bludgeoned by the Rangers that first outing and then turn, turned the page and was was really solid. I, I think Leiter's going to be able to do that, too. Um, I think he's going to recalibrate and and be just fine. Uh, but, yeah, we, the fastball is great, but it's it, it, it takes a an 80-grade fastball to be able to get by when the slider's not there. The changeup for him has always just been that change of pace pitch. He's never really leaned on it more than that. And it was really good. So that's exciting. That's intriguing to see. Uh, but, you know, again, the changeup and the curveball have always been pitches that are hit or miss for him. And it's always fastball slider and then the cutter that, you know, he can really just pound the zone with now and and overpower guys. I, I think he'll come back and do that next time around. Um, and I'm excited to see him do that. He's definitely got the the mental uh, ability to turn the page and, and bounce back. But clearly Bochi had some trust in him. He was leaving him out there and uh, was, was fine with him, you know, running up the pitch count and battling. And uh, I think we'll get another chance next week. And just remember um, you, you, you reminded me kind of a Brian Wu. What about Grayson Rodriguez, right? Five innings, two runs in his yeah. first start. It looked pretty good, but then he got blown up by the Oakland A's in his second start. <laughs> right. And now Grayson Rodriguez is arguably one of the best pitchers in the American league. Brandon fought. Remember his first start got absolutely destroyed. Yeah, it felt like, it was... like the second and the third for him. Yeah, like, it wasn't very really good. Started but then worse. he started lighting it up in the playoffs and then is coming off a seven inning two earn run performance. Like he's a good pitcher too. It just takes these guys a little while. So yeah, yeah we saw flashes of what can be a good pitcher. I'm going to start buying into those flashes instead of look at a stat line where if you watch the game, it shouldn't have been as bad as it was. All right, so not much stock in the stat in the uh, stat line for Jack Leiter. Have you guys already gotten your Cy Young votes in for Tanner Houck? <laughs> What's the deal? I mean, my agenda is incredible right now. The Tanner Houck agenda is alive and well. 
complete game shutout against the best team in baseball by record right now in the Cleveland Guardians. Three hits, no runs, nine Ks, no walks. He threw 94 pitches, 69 for strikes. So this is coming off of a night where Jared Jones threw 50 strikes and 59 pitches. Tanner Houck had way more command issues than than Jones ever did. But, like, that was an out-of-body experience for Jones. I never in a billion years had Tanner Houck throwing a complete game on my bingo card. <laughs> Casual. Thought this guy was going to go four innings. Like, that's what he does. He's a five and dive. It t- you know, it takes 85 pitches to get through five innings, and he walks four, but he survives. Man, like, I what happened? Like, new new pregame meal, like, different bed? Like, I don't know, but that was crazy. The dude's been an absolute beast all year. I think he's rocking a 1-3-5 ERA, and all I went over it. Four starts. I'm just saying the dude's been a beast, right? We're not buying it on our Cy Young votes like you're saying, but this is – these are improvements that we're seeing. He always had a major problem against left-handed bats. The Guardians put out seven – Of their nine. And this is one of the highest scoring offenses in Major League Baseball, right? We talk about how the Royals are scoring all these runs and their offense looks prolific. Right now, as we sit here today, the Guardians have more runs. They almost have 100 runs scored. And Tanner Houck shut them the hell down and was efficient while doing it. This, whatever he's doing, this new thing, it's exciting. I'm excited for Tanner Houck as I'm going to continue to be. What's his new thing? Is he doing a new thing? He is kind of doing a new thing. Um, and I think the new thing is is confidently pitching to contact and mixing in uh, a lot of ground balls and, and not needing to be uh, this guy that's going to try to strike everybody out and and succeed that way. Because like he's got the slider. We know that. We know that's going to be something that's going to be able to put hitters away. Uh, but I also always had the concern of like, okay, how are you going to get lefties out? You know, what's going to be the way that you do that um, when when you're very slider heavy? Um, and he mixed the four seamer in around like 10% of the time last year. He's pretty much kind of eliminated that now. And he's made an adjustment to make that sinker more effective. So he's getting a lot more ground balls. You know, I feel like he's he's able to get that early contact when he needs it. Um, and then mixing in this, this cutter with a little bit more effectiveness, but mostly just to lefties, kind of eliminating it to righties. Uh, but I feel like he's just found that consistency with the sinker. And I think that's been the big difference where he's able to get that weak contact. He's got the splitter. He's got the slider that are both big whiff pitches, but being able to mix in um, early contact, get stuff on the ground between the splitter and the sinker he's able to get a lot on the ground. And then the slider is the put away pitch. Uh, I think it elevated his floor and and now it's kind of helped him go deeper into ball games. And he's definitely been trusting that splitter. And it seems to be a lot better. This year, opponents at 310 against it last year. So far this year, they're hitting a buck 92, and he's throwing it about uh, 8% more, 7, 8% more. So, uh, adjusted sinker, getting more weak contact. Slider's always been there. Splitter's been better. I think you could see some tangible adjustments here. And uh, I think he's finally able to trust that he can fill up the zone and doesn't have to strike everybody out to, to have success. How's that so, for a new thing, Jack? That's a new ass thing. That's a- that's a great new thing. I love that. <laughs> That's why I posed the question to Arm. I was like, I know he's got the new thing, so let's hear about the new thing. It felt like, you know, watching watching the condensed game of Hauk and, and watching a couple half innings through, like, he's always played blitz ball sporadically. He's always had that one blitz ball pitch every now and again. But it feels like he's almost playing a subdued blitz ball more. And that can be because of the splitter. That can be because of the sinker. It just felt like everything was moving some sort of which way. Like there was no pitch that looked hittable for, <laughs> for an average human being. You know what I mean? And like there are arms in pretty much every major league rotation where you have a lot of armchair DHs and they look at it and say, oh, I could hit the shit out of that. Like not one pitch for Tanner Hop that I saw on Wednesday looked like something that a normal, you know, high school baseball washed up or like even, you know, Hey, I was, I was the seven hitting DH at Merrimack. Like, I just don't think that guy's hitting it. And, you know, credit to Tanner Houck for playing a a subdued version of blitz ball all the time. It was sort of like Logan Webb esque, right? With the splitters. It's it's very web. Splitter sliders, um, sinker, and just everything is darting in a couple different directions. So even if you're a lefty, some pitches are going away from you. Some are going in. And then when he's throwing it wherever he wants, it's just hard to pick up. And that's how we can start to get out lefties is now he has more pitches that can go in and could go out to lefties versus just to righties. And when you can get both out, he can be effective. And to arm's point, pitching to contact, get those ground balls. He's a real pitcher. So one other thing 
I think we touched on this a little bit a couple episodes ago um, about like why I think we should buy into what's happening with Hauk. And then I think he went out and got bombed the next outing. Um, and then now did this is, you know, sinker guys, typically sinker is going to play better from a higher release point. Um, and he has brought his release point up about 0.3 feet, which is pretty substantial from 5.2 to 5.5. So wow. bringing that up more, I think is really kind of helping the heaviness and the late dart to that fastball. And he's been getting, you know, a lot more horizontal, I think, which is, which is a huge part of it as well. Uh, another like almost three inches of horizontal on his fastball from a higher release. So it's going to play up already. And then is actually getting more movement. And that's why we're seeing a 5% increase in the strike right there. Cause I think he feels like he can fill up the zone. And then I think also it's helping the splitter because the splitter is hard to throw from this like horizontal release, well, but a little bit do? more, a little bit higher up. Now, I think he's able to kind of stay on top of the splitter more and command it better. So I just think that really release change has been all that he really needed. We, we've known that he's been super talented. No one's ever doubted how talented Tanner Houck is, but now coming from a, you know, a higher vertical angle and, and I think just being able to now work downwards, I think that's really helped his arsenal because we, we Jack and I talked about on the call up. There's a lot of three quarter release guys that their arsenal is conducive to that. Houck I think is a guy that's more conducive to slightly higher than that low three quarters that he was throwing from before. I, I'm just trying to think about what a splitter would do from a low three quarters. Like, I just don't think it, it would do anything. You got to turn it a little bit. But the whole point of a splitter it, is like figuring out a change up adjacent where you don't have to turn your hand. And then it just turns into like a slower version of your fastball. Maybe there's like a perfect, you know, arm path where you get like a Devin Williams type change up, but it's sort of a splitter where it's like yeah. you just kind of freaking like, like, just turning, I don't even know. like I, it's yeah. weird. Like, I don't know, a straight splitter, I just don't know how that could work from a low three quarters. But I like that point where where he kind of rises up a little bit. Um, I want to jump to an interesting clip. And I, I'm going to play the clip for you here right now. This is from Pete Fairbanks after he <laughs> bombed in the outing. This is courtesy of Bally Sports Sun. Take a listen. So an all-encompassing level of suck is one of my new favorite terms and the fact that he set a timer on being pissed off <laughs> is my new other favorite habit so i think that's what i'm going to do whenever i get pissed whenever i get agitated i'm going to set a timer for 16 minutes because i'm going to look internally and i'm going to say what would pete fairbanks do in this situation I related to this so much, not from a plague, but from a betting angle, right? When you lose all your bets, all right, I'm all encompassing suck right now, but I only have a couple of minutes because I got to look at the board tomorrow. So that, that I related to me very well while not you know, being any sort of professional baseball player. You're a lot more like the closer for the Tampa Bay Rays than I think most people are. <laughs> I'm very talented, but I have a 14 ERA right now, is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> so I, it, it is crazy well first of all that i thought that was a really funny interview because like he's clearly livid and instead of just like the classic i'm gonna take it out on the reporters and give them shitty answers and you know and which is understandable from time to time but like they're also just doing their job and if you listen to the way they ask the questions it was like very like i think they did a really good job of like yeah so like how are you going to to trying to turn this thing around and i i can tell that he's just livid that he has to answer those questions but not mad at them he understands the dynamic so yeah. he answers it in a sarcastic way that i think was fun and gives information but also is probably like comedic relief for him like he as much as he seems serious like he's messing around a little bit like once he said 16 minutes yeah. Um, like that's exactly how I would handle something like that. That said, the, the I think the correct answer would have been fastball command. Um, he is not landing his fastball for a strike at all. I mean, about like the if, correct answer, man. We want Fairbanks' answer. Is yes, his fastball has been terrible. That would be the answer. But I, I love that mentality from a reliever. Like, turn the page. I'm going to go out there and try and figure it out. But that was one of my favorite sound bites. I think we've gotten from a player in a while. So you guys have all fallen into the situation of being in like, you know, a media scrum and, you know, like question asking when somebody has a shit day, like the worst day to interact with Jim Beheim was when Syracuse men's oh. basketball lost a game and you knew you were signing up to get bullied if you raised your hand. So I never raised my hand like because I didn't have to. But the local beat writer, like Hall of Famer Mike Waters, would get bullied after every single loss because Jim Beheim took out his anger on the court on the people that asked the questions. And I, I did really appreciate 
how he was pissed. Pete Fairbanks was pissed, but he wasn't pissed at the question asker because there are way too many coaches and players that just immediately project that anger onto the person asking the question. So I, I, I got behind that. And this, this trend has been continuing for Pete Fairbanks just earlier on this year after he got destroyed in Colorado. Instead of going after the interviewers as well, he gave an answer where he was like, the baseballs there were terrible. I couldn't grip it. It was really, really bad. It was super like, I think he used the word slimy or I, I forget the word. It was some some version of the term slick that he could not grip the ball. And he was obviously venting to these people, but he wasn't going after them. He was reflecting, and then this time, it wasn't about the balls, it was about him. And he's not really, if if he's going to make an excuse, I think he thinks it's valid, and I bet it is valid, right? If you ask other Rays pitchers or Rockies pitchers that day, they'd probably say the same. Now that he doesn't have an excuse, he's not trying to make one. So that's why, <laughs> excuse me, randomly okay? coughing now, continuing on your guys' point, Pete Fairbanks has been doing this, always honest, whenever he has whenever he blows a save go straight to bally sports because you're going to get a great great answer and and to arm's point he already has two viral clips this year so yeah. something needs to change and arm you're saying it's fastball command yeah he needs i mean the, the fastball command one hasn't been good and then two like when it is around the zone it's been getting hit pretty hard i think the characteristics aren't totally there either so i don't know if it's a delivery thing or or what it may be but he's going to need to uh then kind of go back to the drawing board a little bit i i, I would say it's kind of getting to the point where it's a little concerning when you have an 8% swinging strike rate overall across your entire arsenal, when you are a reliever and potentially a closer um, that is, that is a little concerning, but you know, he still had some good outings there. So we'll see, see if he can bounce back. The Rays have uh, the 30th ranked bullpen ERA. Whoa. Yeah. Not good. 30th dead last after that outing by Fairbanks, they went to 30th below the Rockies. Was was Ben Dix the the bullpen mastermind there? I think he was. I think he was because huh. the Marlins bullpen has been yeah awesome the, this year yeah, since he came over. Yeah, so that's the thing. <laughs> the Marlins bullpen ain't, ain't been very good. I will say though, he has like thrown some random players in there, like Declan Cronin. He just comes in and gets out. So like he Sox. might he might be building his own Marlins bullpen soon. I'm sure they'll trade all those uh, those relievers and um, hope just build his own. But uh, that is crazy. The Rays not being in the top. 15 yeah i mean i'm so used to them being in the top 10 but let alone being at the bottom of the league like at what point do we start to like look at that and be worried about that i know it's april 19th but like is there a point where that becomes a thing you, you know what the deal is they imagine. don't have the king of the hold andrew kittredge we went over that on the uh on the wednesday show, did you right? hear that arm did you hear that andrew kittredge had th has thrown seven innings this year for the cardinals and has seven holds Isn't that electric it, that is <laughs> That is the worst stat in baseball, I it's think. It's the best stat because it's the worst. <laughs> I still don't even totally understand it. But that that is crazy. I mean, he's been good. I'm surprised they let him walk, but I, they, they think they can just spawn arms. And, you know, some years, I mean, they have, but I guess the one year where you can't spawn them, how do you, how do you, you know, react and how do you adjust? I'm interested to see how the Rays start to figure out this bullpen and shuffle things around. Fortunately, they've, they're going to have some guys getting healthy on the rotation side, but I, I am interested to see how they adjust with this bullpen for sure. All right. Jumping to another guy that uh, really struggled with the heater. Um, Tristan McKenzie, something came out, an article came out in the athletic from Zach Meisel and Jason Lloyd. And the headline is guardian Tristan McKenzie faced Tommy John and decided against it. Did he make the right choice? This article really gets into Tristan McKenzie is pitching in 2024 with what sounds like, and they don't concretely say it in the article, a partially torn UCL. They, they mentioned like where he's looking, but that's the deal. Like partial tear, he had the choice. It was either Tommy John surgery or rest and rehab. And Tristan McKenzie started four games last year, two in June, and then two at the end of the regular season. I think it was like September 25th and September 30th. So far this year, Tristan McKenzie's velo is noticeably way down. His command is noticeably way worse. 13 innings across three starts, 11 hits, nine earned, struck out five, walked 12 in 13 innings. That's not Tristan McKenzie. He threw 191 innings in 2022. He walked 2.1 hitters per nine, and he's walked 12 in 13 innings. The velo down again. He's clearly not healthy. 
it sucks that we have to have the sister conversation to the one we have when people are blowing out now, which it feels like is every week, right? We just saw Calvin Ziegler and the Mets organization just go down with TJ on Thursday morning. And we talked about that during the Mets top prospect episode on the call up. Like it is an every week thing that we're talking about this. And McKenzie, you got to remember, he's only 26 years old. He's what, three years younger than Bieber. He debuted at 22. Feels like he should be 28, 29 years old, but he's 26. I think based on reading that, he was really worried to take away a year and a half or two years of when he feels, you know, maybe his best, which is mid to late 20s. But at the end of the day, man, like this version of Tristan McKenzie is so clearly not right. And it's so clearly hurting not only the Cleveland Guardians, but the long term outlook on Tristan McKenzie. Like it's it's tanking his numbers right now. I I wonder if this piece is kind of like the first little domino of like an inevi- in, inevitable decision, because I, I'm thinking about it. Of course, you always want to avoid Tommy John because of the, the layoff. And, and I think there's even some instances where uh, it might have come out later that we maybe even been a little too trigger happy on Tommy John in, in terms of maybe sometimes it could have been rehabbed, but a lot of times we just see that it doesn't end up working out too well. Uh, but I also think it's a little bit of confirmation bias. We'll always remember the players that rehabbed didn't work out and then got TJ and not the guys that had a little bit of an elbow flare up rehabbed. And then we just forget about it. Uh, but I hear the point and I'm assuming that that's what he was thinking is like, I, when I'm healthy, I'm throwing the heck out of the ball. I mean, you remember when the last time we saw him at hundred percent, I mean, he was, Lights amazing. out. I mean, he was, he was flashing 90 innings at a sub three. He's flashing like frontline stuff, you know, at least number two kind of stuff. Uh, but he's an arb one right now. And if he, you know, delays this any longer and it doesn't get better, he can kind of put himself in this weird spot where it can really wipe things out for him for a while. So like, I, I think it's something they, they got to figure out sooner rather than later, because You know, of course, if you're going to end up getting the surgery, you would have probably preferred to have gotten it at the end of last year. So you could be back earlier. If he gets it this year, he's going to be probably wiped out for almost all of next year as well. But if he's in ARB1 right now and he tries to pitch through it and then decides to get it later in the season, he might not be back until sometime during ARB3, which would be the last year before he hits free agency. So it's a tough spot. And, you know, I don't envy that at all. And there's a lot smarter people making this decision than me. But I feel like they've got to figure out which way this is going pretty soon here, Uh, because if you're delaying the inevitable, you're pitching at a lower level now, hurting yourself now, and then you're going to have that layoff anyways. Like It's it's a tough spot. I, I really feel for McKenzie. So different scenario, but similar timeline. Andrew Painter. Yeah. Painter cost himself two years, unfortunately. And it wasn't Painter costing himself. It was, you know, his like was not a partial tear. He was going to try and pitch through it. And then it just wasn't working. And, you know, what could have been an April cut date turned into a July or August cut date. And instead of coming back around the all-star break this year, we won't see when healthy, arguably the best pitching prospect in all of baseball until the start of the 2025 season. We'll see him next spring training in 2025. That's what the in-season delay prompts, which is really tough. And you know, it, it, I'm with you. Like the pull the trigger too soon is a really worrisome thing. And you would prefer not to get the surgery at all. Right. And Tristan McKenzie preferred not to get the surgery at all. But, you know, if you read this article on the athletic and I'll link it in the episode description, like he's clearly thinking about his body and his health every time something feels off. And that's Mm -hmm. just like, I don't want Tristan McKenzie to feel like that on behalf of Tristan McKenzie. I'm just like, dude, I want you to be stress-free. And right now it feels like stress-free is an impossible goal for him, which is sad and it sucks. And I hope, you know, he does what's best for him. So we have seen some pitchers be able to operate lineups, perform well with this partial tear. The first one that comes to mind is Masahiro Tanaka, who I think pitched multiple years with this problem in his elbow. I think he's still going and he didn't get cut. Exactly. (laughs) Something like that. Like he's still going, but Masahiro Tanaka was a five pitch guy. He wasn't a, I throw my fastball anywhere from 55 to 60% of the time. And that's my bread and butter, right? It's only 92 and a half, but it has that insane ride. He's able to locate it at the top of the zone, which then sets up the tunneling for his slider and his curveball. 
But if that fastball is so hittable right now, if that velo is coming down and he doesn't have the same ride and that's his go-to pitch, I just don't know how he can be successful with a drop-off and stuff. Whereas Tanaka never relied on high velocity at the top of the zone. It was splitters and sinkers and cutters and sliders, and he can move it wherever he wants. But with McKenzie so fastball reliant and with that fastball down two miles an hour, I just don't see how he can be successful operating like this. And so does that say, well, Peter, do you think he should get Tommy John? I don't know what he should do. All I know is right now, operating like this, I don't see it working. It's it's tough. And you go back to the end of 2022, the final 15 starts of the year. Hit a 2 4 ADRA, 98 innings. He punched out 106, walked just 17. So remember, command used to be a, a, an issue for him. He seemed to have really figured that out, and he was trusting his stuff. But and that's that's the frustrating part is you saw a guy that had this epiphany, both from a mechanical standpoint and then also trusting his stuff. And now he can't trust his stuff again for reasons that are outside of his control. That is the part that really stinks. So, yeah, I mean, you you just don't want to get away from who you were and, and you know, what you figured out and the success that you had. So, you know, I wonder how many more starts they give him here to to try to work this out because, I mean, it's I think it's very clear. You don't go from 17 walks and 98 innings. That's a four and a half walk rate by the percent walk rate, by the way, to, yeah. to now, you know, walking 12 guys through your first three starts and, yeah. you know, as opposed to five strikeouts, like we saw what healthy McKenzie could do at the the back half of 2022. And, um, you know, we even saw a couple outings like that in 2023, but it just really hasn't been the same since. So um, I'm sure that the guardians are trying to figure all that out, but it's tough for them too, because, you know, obviously Bieber's out. Gavin Williams has been on the shelf. Uh, they have other guys coming up, but it's, it, it's just been a little bit of tough luck. And and I'm sure they're pretty desperate just for some established arms. And McKenzie's one of the few that they have that, you know, has been uh, available uh, at least remotely now in the early parts of this year, but you know, at what cost? Bieber, McKenzie and Espino can make even mm-hmm. the most sane guardians fans start to lose it. I'm sorry. Like it's just, it's blow after blow for guardians fans and you know, we so see we, ya, we, we're with you. We did have to bring this up, but it does seem like we're almost eulogizing the Guardians a little bit when they're no, about they're to take three or baseball. four from the Red Sox, and they're there. They just keep winning. Like, they don't give a shit about any of this stuff. Like, Ben Lively comes in and pitches okay, right? It's Carlos Carrasco today. 9-4-9 ERA in Fenway going into it. One run allowed today. I mean, they just win. So, like... There's the there's the bad side of this where it looks like some of the stars are either going on the shelf or not performing. And then there's the other side of Guardians Nation right now where it's like, who gives a shit? We win every day. Yeah. So I wonder what I want to talk to them and be like, how are you? How are you? Are you okay? Is it good? I feel like they've got to be worried. They've got to be. They've got to be, but you know, just having Tanner Bybee, like what, what a godsend, you know, and, and just how consistent he's been. Logan Allen is just turned into a guy that you can really, you know, rely on from the left side. You mentioned just plug and play lively right now. You hope that Gavin Williams can come back at some point. You know, I don't know how they're, they're definitely gonna be very cautious with him, but then, you know, some guys have thrown well for them in the upper minors. So I think this is going to be, you know, can, can Xavier and Curry stand, you know, step up and, and, and fill in innings can, uh, they will they potentially be aggressive with Doug Nikhazy, who has looked really good uh, so far out of the gate this year. I texted you asking about Nikhazy. I said, "Why is Nikhazy great?" And guess I, what? I got no response. I, wow. I still need wow. I s- still need to do the dive, uh, but I know he's doing well. So that's another funky lefty that could be you know helpful for them. They have guys that they can plug in and survive with, but you know you, you're looking at the the impact, the high upside, the the guys that you you know you want to put in a big game. Um, that's where I get a little bit worried, but hopefully Gavin Williams can come back and, uh, you know, you'll still see Tanner Bybee just continue to get better and better. And I, I still think they can find a way to make this all work. All I heard from that was arm left you on red. That's <laughs> no, I asked too many questions. That's my problem. I asked too many questions and then like he answers three and then two are left unanswered. And I, you know, like I, I get nervous. I'm like, I don't want to read the classic. It's 1130 at night and you're in bed and you're just like on fan graphs or watching some other league game. It's like, well, what about this guy? Arm? And Arm's like, I'm going to bed. Like, I don't know it's about the like outfielder in double a right now. <laughs> right. So we'll see. All right. Okay. Peter, you have 20 games in 
adjusted win totals. And again, we did over under before the season, like three days, four days before the season began. Um, but you found one in each division that was an interesting line and you're going to throw it at us. And, you know, I, I, are we playing over under again, or is it just a conversation about the new number? This is a new game, right? So basically there were a couple ones that are very close in each division, just based off what you've seen. You can give me your kind of your general feel for how accurate these projected win totals are. Again, they're all on fan graphs. You go under depth charts and they're just continually updating their projections. A good example, the Dodgers were projected about 103 wins by fan graphs. Now down to 92, which is fascinating. And so we're going to go, there are a couple of groupings of teams that are right in the thick of it together and they're projected in the thick of it together. So I thought it'd be a cool conversation. Talk about two teams that are very similar and see who we might like a little bit more for the rest of the season. So we'll start in the American League East. The Blue Jays are projected 85 wins. The Rays are projected 86 wins. Right now, they're both 10 and 9, both with negative run differentials to start the season. The Rays have had horrible bullpen issues. The Blue Jays have just been not that good, but are still 10 and 9 and had a good series against the Yankees. So the question to you guys is, who do you think has more wins at the end of the season after what you've seen between the Rays and the Blue Jays? Arm, we can go to you first. Mm. That's an interesting one. I like it kind of ties back to the conversation. At what point do we start to get worried about the Rays? We're tying it back here. right now. Like kind of getting there. Um, the Blue Jays. Oh, that's a tough one. Because right, the Blue I have, Jays, I think I have are my coaching. answer. I have my answer. I, if you want, if you want to hear it quick. Yeah, I'll fill in. I'll fill in. I'm curious what you guys think. So I'm watching this Blue Jays team basically at full strength, right? Like, this is the Blue Jays. They haven't really had Eric Swanson. They haven't really had Jordan Romano. But what we see from the Blue Jays is kind of who they are. The Rays, their offense has been banged up all season long. Josh Lowe is now returning. Brandon Lau has been out a ton. And then the rotation. They still are not fully healthy. And then the bullpen has also been off to a horrible start. So the Rays are not a fully healthy team. And there are a couple of things in their bullpen that I just don't believe. While the Blue Jays, I feel like we know who the Blue Jays are at this point. They have these pitchers, they have these hitters, and this is their bullpen. And they're kind of performing exactly how I thought they would be. So Fangraphs has the Rays a win higher. I agree with them. I would take the Rays because I think the Rays are playing poorly, not up to their standards, and they still have the same record as the Blue Jays, where I feel like I know who the Blue Jays are. So I'm going with the Rays. Identical reasoning on my end. Um, Ryan Pepio. Is it just going to be an every other start thing? He I went six so. innings, allowed one run. Like he was in Colorado. He looked like the best pitcher ever, but there was a clunker before that. And there was a semi clunker in between. They have a legitimate pop-up arm in Littell. Like they found a starting pitcher moving forward. They found this iteration of Eflin where it was like, yeah, he's fine. Uh, no, he's really good. So I I'm in on what Littell's cooking, but yeah, same reasoning. Yeah. I mean, I look at the reinforcements even on, on the race side, like, Palacios has been doing some good things, but then you have DeLuca who could, you know, fit into a nice platoon situation in the outfield when he comes back off of that broken hand from spring training. Um, you mentioned the other players, but you also have uh, Junior Camonero who could be up very soon, came off the IL, has already just been swinging it really well in AAA, and he's big league ready and you know, could be one of the most impactful rookies in, in baseball once he gets up. I will say on the Blue Jays side, though, they did just call up Yariel Rodriguez. I do think he helps their staff. Uh, they haven't gotten Kevin Gosman yet. You know, it's been four starts with an eight ERA from Gosman as he comes back from injury. I think he's going to settle in and be better. I just continue to worry about this this bullpen, though. I, I, Jordan Romano is one of my like one of the closers that I have the least faith in every single time he comes in. Yimmy's been great. Chad Green's been solid. But, yeah, I, I do have some concerns there. So. Yeah, I'm going to side with the Rays just because of all the reinforcements that they have coming in. I think it's easier to to make that case there, uh, especially knowing that you are going to get Boz back at some point this year. Some of the guys in the rotation right now may end up just moving to the bullpen and helping the bullpen. Uh, and then they've got some guys in AAA that can end up going into that bullpen and helping as well. So, yeah, I, I'm going to side with the Rays on this one, though I do think the Jays are playing a little bit better ball than um, – Maybe the record shows. I actually think they're they're going to be uh, they're going to hang around this year. Uh, but I I do have more faith in the Rays. Yeah, it's the problem. It's like when we start comparing right the Blue Jays to the Rays. The Blue Jays are a good team. Right, you put the Blue Jays in the Central, they might be one of the best teams there. Right, it's just context. 
They're in the AL East, and they face a great team every single day. The Red Sox are in last place, and they're still a good team. So yeah. we're not hating on the Blue Jays. We just prefer the Rays a little bit more. Um, let's move to the AL Central. Fangraphs hates this division, apparently. They have the Guardians and the Royals tied at the top, projected 81 wins. <laughs> so they have both of them basically neck and neck to win this division, both at 81. So that begs the question. Jack, we'll go to you first. Or I can give my answer first, whatever you prefer. Guardians or Royals? Who do you think takes it? Royals. I'm not thinking twice about it. You pointed Ooh. out my Seth Lugo blind spot, and I appreciate you doing that because he's the forgotten man, but Lugo's good. Singer being this good, Reagan's proving that last year, like last year, second half Reagan's felt like that second half of 15, front half of 16, Jake Arietta, where it was like, uh, we're probably never going to see this version again, but like, this version of Cole Reagan's is still really damn good. That rotation is like legit solid. I think that rotation is legit, like one or two in the AL Central. And that lineup, man, like, again, we've talked about Bobby Witt. Bobby Witt's real. This top five player in baseball thing is fully real. Um, I don't know. It, they had a good offseason. And this first 20 game stretch did enough for me to convince me that the Royals are going to win the division. Fair enough. Arm, what do you think? I don't want to like be so reactionary on April 19th, but when you look at what's happened since we have, you know, gave our preseason predictions on, on the guardians and then, you know, what's happened with the Royals since then too, the thing that kind of pushes me over the edge is that I have no faith in, if you have two teams that are in a similar record right around the deadline, I have way more faith in the Royals adding than the guardians. Mm -hmm. I, the guardians just love to sit in the middle. Um, and maybe if players get if the angels dump players on waivers again, maybe that's what the guardians will do. They'll, they'll just claim more players on waivers. But like, other than that, I just don't have a lot of confidence in them adding and you know, they, they're getting some great stuff from Gabriel Arias right now. But you know, if he, if he slows down a little bit, you look at the back end of that lineup. Like Ramon Laureano has been pretty brutal. Will Brennan has really struggled. Uh, Tyler Freeman is, is, is not very good. Uh, so I, I just, I do worry about the, the back part of that lineup. And then now with the pitch, I do think it's going to be good enough and they can piece it together to survive 162 and hang around, but it could get ugly quick. You know, if, especially if Bybee, you know, I, I have a lot of trust in Bybee. I think Logan Allen can be solid, but if those guys falter a little bit, then all of a sudden it starts to get uh, pretty rough with the rest of the rotation. And there's a lot of pressure on, on that bullpen, which has been really good. And I think that's a separator though. Is the guardians bullpen is really, really good. Um, at least so far this year and, and the Royals, it's I don't know if I have as much faith in them being able to hold it over the whole year. Um, but I'm I'm gonna go Royals with with the offense, with the idea that they're gonna add and um just the pitching looking the way that it has looked. Who would have thought that like Singer would be this good? And if that continues, um I just think it's two teams kind of trending in different directions, though the Guardians may have been more talented coming into the year. I'm gonna go with the Guardians. I think the Guardians are the better team. Arm, you make a really good point, Jack, you did as well, about the bottom of the Guardians lineup and how it's not that good. However, I would take the top of the Guardians offense over the top of the Royals offense, even though mm -hmm. the Royals offense does have Bobby Witt Jr. But I'm also looking at a bottom of the Royals offense where Salvador Perez is off to a really good start. Do we think he's going to slash 324, 375, 74? Probably not. Now you could say, well, what about Josh Naylor, who's been really, really hot? I have much more faith in Josh Naylor moving forward. Right. MJ Melendez got off to a really, really hot start last week. He's been one of baseball's worst hitters, but he, he'll go up and down. Him. Yeah. yeah. I think he'll be fine. But overall, right. If that's your five hitter, we'll see. And then we keep working down like Nelson Velasquez off to a good start. Is he going to continue that? Adam Frazier off to a horrific start. I don't know if he's going to keep being in the lineup. Hunter Renfro, same thing. Kyle Isbell, same thing. So for the, the reasons that you're worried about the Guardians lineup, I'm also worried about the Royals, but then I'm more confident in a Stephen Kwan, Andres Jimenez, Jose Ramirez, and Josh Naylor over the front four for Kansas City. Now, the Royals rotation is better, especially with Bieber going down, especially with McKenzie. We talked about all these issues, but the Guardians bullpen is much better. The Guardians bullpen right now ranks second in ERA, yeah. I think is, uh, let me quote that correctly. Yeah, runs, well, oh no, I'm on the Royals. Yeah, 12th, Guardians are second. So if I have, I think, a better offense, 
I think I have better defense as well with Cleveland. I think I have the better bullpen. And I also have a team that just two years ago was coming off 92 wins with a lot of the same guys on this roster. So I think the Guardians are more proven. I think they know that their window is opening sooner than the Royals is, that this is kind of year one. I think the Royals are off to a good start. I think they're going to finish second in the division. But I would, I'm would i given a slight edge to Cleveland here overall. If Cleveland adds at all, like if I knew that they'd be remotely aggressive, I'd, I'd agree with you 100%. No, but you're just, right, though. That is something. Because I, I, I also have more faith in the Royals adding than I do the Guardians. I'm with you. Like From a roster, like a complete roster perspective, the Guardians are just more complete. Um, and then, you know, you have the guys at the top, like you mentioned, that I just have a little bit more faith in being consistent. Um, and Quan being off to the start that he's on is, is is awesome. And especially when he came on and kind of talked about some of the specific things that he wanted to do, and he's doing them uh, out of the gate this year. I, it is a really unique one because I feel like in a month, uh, the perspective could change again uh, on on these teams with all the fluidity uh, for good and bad with with both of these rosters. If the if I knew that the Guardians would just go out and 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 get a you know an arm and a bat at some point in the deadline, I'd I'd feel really good. Um, but I think it's going to be a fun little battle between these two teams. And it'll be interesting to see if the bullpen that the Guardians have can separate itself enough from the Royals to make up for a little bit of the edge and and the rotation that the Royals now have, even just having a Waka in the back end of that as well. Uh, it's going to be fun. And I'm glad because like the Central like kind of needed this. Um, and, and I think it's going to be a kind of a, a unique, fun, new battle that we haven't really had, which is always great for baseball. And not to just gloss over the Tigers, who've been playing well, too. They're just projected at 79 wins. I just thought to locate the top two teams exactly. But Tigers could be competing here, too. I'm not as high on them, but we have seen good things, and they're, they are playing well. So shout out Detroit. Yep. Um, this one I thought was just wrong. Fangraphs has the Mariners and the Rangers. Mariners two games projected above the Texas Rangers has the Rangers no. down at 82 wins. No. And I wanted to bring that up to you guys. I assume we're all making the same face where it's like, what, what the hell? But then I can understand why the projections are higher on the Mariners. You look at the starting rotation and you also look that Julio Rodriguez has done absolutely nothing. So we know that he's going to go crazy. We also know that their bullpen is getting healthier, right? When Brash returns and, you know, Gregory Santos and all these guys, and they have a full bullpen unit to look at. So I can see the allure of the Mariners, but I can't put them over the Rangers who hit every single day and they're going to get back an entire rotation off the IL. And I do think that they are going to be, right, we talk about the Guardians maybe not adding. That's a team that's definitely going to add at the deadline, most likely bullpen arms. They already did it last offseason. They were willing to trade a guy like Cole Reagans in order to get a role as Chapman. So they're going to plug those holes at the back end. But the fact that it was a two-win difference shocked me. Are you yeah. guys as shocked? Or do you still have full belief in the Mariners? Because maybe I'm operating. I was low on the Mariners coming into the year. You guys were higher. So do I have a blind spot a little bit? Quick game. Aram, what are the Miami Marlins hitting right now as a team? Batting average-wise? Batting average. 212? 216. Huh. What are the Seattle Mariners hitting as a team? Got to be lower the way he's posing the question. Yeah, but I'm going to go 218. 213. Wow. Mariners are hitting 213 as a team. They have a 648 team OPS. They that. are bottom five in Major League Baseball and run scored. That's not just a Julio thing. That's, all, that's the only point that I have to make. Yeah, that's really bad. That's really, really bad. I mean, I do have like some concerns about like the fact that you know, I think they were relying on a pretty sizable role from Luke Raley and, and he's not been good. Um, and now he's Crawford. kind of awesome. yeah, not playing. It's on JP Crawford. It's just, so he, he, he looks every time you're like, Oh, okay. Now this is the JP Crawford. Then he has these stretches where yeah, he doesn't look great. Jorge Polanco has been a disaster. Uh, I, I'm not worried about Julio Rodriguez, but when you have all these different guys that have been kind of a disaster, I mean, Ty France is just never going to slug, I guess. Like it, it's, it's a little concerning. I'm, I think Mitch Garver is going to be fine. I think Cal Raleigh is going to be better, but I, I don't think all of these guys are going to turn it around. Like that's, that's very ambitious. And then you'll get the rotation. Uh, it's been a slow start for Castillo. It's been a slow start for Kirby. And then they're relying on Emerson Hancock for innings right now. Thank goodness for Bryce Miller or else 
and, and Logan Gilbert or else they'd be, you know, in big trouble. But I do think Castillo is going to bounce back. I think Kirby's going to bounce back. So the, that is the like devil's advocate side. So it is the rotation is going to get better. You assume they're going to get Brian Wu back at some point with the elbow inflammation, but that's a very open-ended thing. You don't totally know. Same thing with Brash. It's elbow inflammation. We'll find out, you know, when we find out those are good reinforcements and they're going to get Gregory Santos back as well at some point to help that bullpen. The bullpen has been fine, actually pretty good overall. So, I, like I'm still gonna believe in this team, um, but not more than the Texas Rangers. Uh, I I just can't because that argument that I just made for the Mariners, you can make like Peter alluded to, 10x with the Rangers. They have Hall of Famers coming back, whether they're in their prime or not. They they got Hall of Famers coming back, and they're gonna have young guys that are gonna keep performing better as they get used to their sophomore season too. Even though they're technically rookies in in an Evan Carter or even a rookie in Wyatt Langford, he's gonna get better as the year goes on and settle in on the back half. I, I got way more faith in the Rangers at this point, and I think they've got a lot more uh, you know to work with at the upper levels of the minors as well, and and I think way more of injury uh, talent that's gonna be coming back. You know, like White Langford has done nothing so far. He's going to go crazy at some point. Yeah, <laughs> like Evan Carter is going to keep improving too. Corey Seager hasn't even been in the lineup every day. He's not slugging. Corey Seager hasn't slugged at all. I, I think he's slugging like three seventy five as he comes back from this this hernia injury, which I'm sure has you know sapped some of that explosion and some of that power. Uh, I, I'm expecting most of those guys to get rolling, and then yeah, you mentioned all the different arms that are going to come back, and they've got trade capital. And you know, Josh Young will be back before the end of the season. They've been doing it without Nathaniel Lowe, who's been out the entire season so far. Like, I mean, this team has had as many injuries as, as anybody, and they're still hanging around. So I think they're going to get better just through experience, and then they're going to get better with uh, returning you know, health-wise, and then they'll probably go make some trades too, and they've still got plenty of prospects they can trade from. How about Josh Smith? Plugging in at third base. He's been good for the Rangers. And Ezekiel Durant obviously played first base today. They could really mix and match. Yeah, I I totally agree with you guys. I thought I might have been crazy by being like, of course the Rangers are better. But Fangraphs has the Mariners two wins projected above the Texas Rangers. All right, let's move to the National League East. This one, no comparison because we know exactly who the Braves are. I think we know who the Phillies are. I think we know who the Marlins are. And I think we know who the Nationals are. Who do we not know? The New York Mets projected at 83 wins. Over. Whoa. They've looked better, right? We, we're talking about the Mets projected at 83. The Rangers are projected at 82. That's why it's so crazy. Fangraphs is that low on this Texas team, and they're this high on the Mets. How about the Mets? The bridge year. Maybe not so bridgy anymore. Over under 83 wins. Jack, you're way over, huh? You're LFGM, in. GM, man. I, I've got Mets fever. I love that fan base. I love that city. I'm all about the New York Mets. Um, I think we are ignoring that they have Pete Alonso, Francisco Lindor, and Brandon Nimmo in this lineup. Francisco Alvarez is amazing. He's one of my favorite catchers to watch in all of baseball. And this dude, he's he's great. Like, he packs such a punch. And we talked about it yesterday, Peter, like Harrison Bader looks happy. Dude had a 650 <laughs> OPS and he's still smiling. It's fun. Um, I think the vibes are better in New York than they've been in the last couple of years mm -hmm. because the stress is off. And a stress-free team with Pete Alonso, Francisco Lindor, who's got back-to-back six-win seasons, Brandon Nimmo, Francisco Alvarez. How about a stress-free Brett Beatty? Like, dude, there are way too many things that are going on in a positive way for me to like doubt the New York Mets right now, Sevy's got a two one through like four <laughs> starts, man. Like I, and we talk about, okay. Like, you know, how good are the four and five in that rotation? You got Manaya and Hauser in there. We were just pounding the pavement for Christian Scott to debut in like two days. Like we want it bad. Yeah. There's so much good going on in New York that like we weren't ready to talk about because this was already branded as a bridge year. Well, when you, factor in that Christian Scott could come in and, you know, I don't think it'll be a hundred percent, but if he gives you 80% of Jerry Jones right now, yeah, dude, that elevates your bulk. I, and I think he will, like, I genuinely 80, think he will. 80% of Jared Jones is like 80% of Jared Jones right now is like 80% of the best pitcher in major league baseball right now. <laughs> like he's Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. Like, and I think he could come out like hot and do that. And then they're still going to hopefully get Kodai Sanga back. They're Lindor, as you said, is going to perform better. The fact that Beatty he hasn't slugged, but he's hitting 300 right now is pretty exciting. Um, and 
I, I just I, I'm starting to look at this Mets team and say, oh, wait, I mean, I might be able to buy into this. Oh, yeah, by the way, JD Martinez is gonna show up at some point once his body's not sore anymore, or whatever the hell that is. But like they're adding JD there too. And and that's gonna be in p- place of DJ Stewart, who actually has been slugging a little bit lately, but you know, you don't have to count on DJ Stewart as much. Uh, you can have him as a left-handed masher off the bench, but you're adding JD Martinez to this lineup. I think a lot of these guys are going to start swinging it better. They're already playing pretty well. They have more pitching reinforcements coming. Jose Budo looks like he's figured something out. Um, I'm very interested with these Mets, man. It was rock bottom. Uh, you know, th- that was hilarious. Gary Cohen is yeah. saying like, oh, yeah, it's it's rock. This is what rock bottom. You can't hit rock bottom in the first week of April. I'm yeah. sorry. This, this uh, shit don't look like rock actually, bottom. Actually, no. well, are the White Sox of the Barlids have hit rock bottom in April. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I guess. Know. The White Sox might experience new depths, man. Yeah, I was just saying, I also think the Marlins up? could experience new depths. I, I actually disagree. I think they will find some more depths. Like, you think you hit the bottom. The Mariana's part. Trench, you move a little bit over to the left. Mariana's Trench is over there. Five games you can't hit rock bottom. Here's a perfect example why they're interesting. So here's where I here's why I started smiling, and I feel like such a dickhead. We know the New York Mets. As soon as everything looks great, you yeah, can't the New York that. Mets. I know. I I didn't want to say it because oh. I feel like it's a dick move, and it's like. Well, we could get excited just for it to be the classic New York Mets, but you know what? I'm not going to do that. No, you, I agree. No, you know what? Quick pause. You are right because as soon as we brand it as bad, things go better than expected, and as soon as we brand it as oh, this gets intriguing, they just I know, out. dude. I broke down it. MJ Melendez's swing for like 15 minutes, and since then he's 0 for like 12. <laughs> yeah. Like it's just, it's just, just you just. I mean, this is what happens when you talk every day. Like, I, but I just, it just happens. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And this is baseball. Jack, it's like, I mean, you guys know the Mets. We know the Mets very well. As soon as things are looking awesome, right? There's so many more areas, right? You talk about Lindor, he's hitting 150. No way that can continue. The Mets offense is going to get better. They're going to get Kodai Senga back. The bullpen Edwin looks Diaz great. Is Edwin Diaz. Edwin yeah. Diaz is Edwin Diaz. Of course they're going to go over. And then, Edwin and then they met. And then they met. You know what? I don't think they're going to bet this year. Actually, what what would Mets fans want us to say? Would they I, I want don't know us to curse them because then know. they'll start playing well. What what should we I'm do not, here? I'm not going to share my take. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to share. My, I would get in trouble. All right, here's the take: the Mets are projected 83 wins by Fangraphs. That's it. That's the take. Is that yeah. fair? I, yeah. Okay, so, so we are not liable for anything. Nothing. Nothing. No. Nope. Right? But I am excited about the Mets. Nope. I take it back. National League Central. Two teams that I find fascinating. A lot of hype. One team's performed better than the other, but they're both projected for 80 wins. Cincinnati Reds and Pittsburgh Pirates, both at 80. There's probably more things to be excited about early on with the Pirates. Jared Jones looks like a freak of nature. Paul Skeens, unfortunately, I think we heard a rumor that he was might debut on Friday. That got taken away. So I don't think we're going to see that debut yet. But Keller's been good. Martin Perez has been awesome. The bullpen's been good. The offense has been exciting. And the Reds have fallen a little bit flat on their face to start. But I think the Reds have a more talented roster than the Pirates do. This one was my toughest one, personally, to pick and choose between these two teams. Jack, we'll start with you. Pirates or Reds? Is O'Neill Cruz still leading baseball in punch outs? I think he might be. He was yesterday. He's already punched out 31 times. Henry Davis has been very not good. Well, they have Joey uh, Bart. Joey Bart got hit in the head with a home run ball in the bullpen and hasn't been okay for like four days. Oh, really? Yeah. That's like that crazy. Was, that was the report. Apparently, he was going to be ready to go on Wednesday, but he still wasn't feeling good. Oh, no. That's horrible. Yeah, it sucks. Um, but no IL stint, but like just a freak thing that happened. See, Tyler O'Neill just went on the IL for his. There's something wrong with his head. Yeah, it, just bad. Um, that collision was brutal. Yeah, brutal. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I want to hear your guys' sides. And then I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll make my Reds case. Cali. Like, Nick Lodolo's back. <laughs> Um, looks good. I hope he can stay healthy and keep doing it, but man, like that, if, if Nick Lodolo is doing that, sign me up, you know, Frankie Montas, I don't think he's going to be an ace. Like I think, we're, but he's a, he's an arm for them that I think is going to be solid through most of the year. Uh, we've seen great things from Andrew Abbott. 
Hunter Green, I, again, I think he's looked better than the numbers would indicate. And yeah, I don't know if he's going to pitch like an ace, but I think he's a really solid arm. It, it looks like the rotation is is well-rounded. The bullpen's been a bit of an issue. I think that's one of the easier things to to fix overall. And um, they have some guys, they got Zach Maxwell in the minor leagues throwing 99 and a half with 20 inches of vert. He might come up and end up helping them out of the bullpen. Uh, but, you know, you start to see Ellie De La Cruz pick it up a little bit, which is exciting. Uh, I, I don't love Jonathan India, but he ain't hitting 160 this whole year. Uh, I, I think this team is just more well-rounded, but when the pirates get, you know, Paul Skeens up there, uh, and, and maybe some of those guys start hitting a bit better and, and Henry Davis and you hope O'Neill Cruz, you know, starts to find a little bit more consistency. I could see it. I just think with the experience that the Reds had last year, like, I think that's the experience the pirates are going to have this year. Um, so I just feel like the, the Reds are kind of like a year ahead and then have a little bit more reinforcements from just a, a well-roundedness perspective. I, I side with the Reds. I'm going with the Reds as well. Um, you mentioned Jonathan India hitting 160. He's not going to do that all year. Heimer Candelario is not going to hit 190 either. And Christian Encarnacio Strand is also not going to hit 192, right? Maybe he'll hit like 230, but he's going to hit a bunch of home runs. So there and no Friedel. And no Friedel and no Matt McClain, who's going to come back soon, right? No, probably not. No, not, for not at all. Time. Yeah, no. I think he's out for the year. He's probably out for the whole year. He is probably out for the entire year. But I just look at this Reds rotation, and, and while we're very excited about Jared Jones, how long is Martin Perez going to keep this up? And is Pirates. Mitch Keller a bona fide ace, right? When when I feel like I can rely on Montes and Green and Abbott and Lodolo and Ashcraft, like this is the exact rotation that Reds fans thought was going to win them the division. And I don't think that they're wrong. They just haven't had all of them in the rotation all at one point until basically right now because Nick Lodolo just returned. So I think the Reds' offense is better. I think the Reds' starting rotation is better. I think the Pirates' bullpen is better, though. That's something where I think the Pirates have the advantage. But the Reds' also a little bit more mature. They've been here for a little bit longer. I think the Pirates have been a great story. I think the Pirates, I kind of almost think both teams overperform 80 wins. Is that crazy? Like, I think both teams go over, but the Reds go over more? I don't think that's crazy. That's kind of where I'm feeling right now. Or maybe they're both like between 81 to 83. That's where I'd peg these teams with the Reds being the higher end projection. Gotcha. But I did find it interesting that Fangraphs has them both pegged at 80. All right, let's move on to the National League West. Two teams tagged at 84 wins. Gentlemen, you like the Diamondbacks or the Padres more? Mm. San Diego. Mm. Diamondbacks. I'm no one I've, I've been a Padres me. believer going into the year. Um, I'm just going to kind of ride that wave. I, I like, I think the, I think it's going to be a, like a race in this division. I think everyone's going to play really well. I think the D backs are going to continue to play good ball and, and be better, you know, down the stretch. And I, I think they're going to be a, a really solid team because they got a lot of reinforcements coming, but I just, I'm, I'm, I'm believing in this Padres team. I think it's a little bit of that fresh look as well. Uh, and guys that I think are starting to play with a little bit more passion and, and having the youthful injection and then seeing what Michael King's doing, seeing Dylan cease throw. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I like what we got going on here in San Diego. Um, the neck tightness thing with Darvish stinks, but he, you know, at least it's just a neck thing. He should be back. I, I, just I have a feeling the star power finally shines through in San Diego. I totally get where you guys are coming from. Like, it's hard to still stick with the Diamondbacks, but just because I was high on them at the beginning of the season, I still thought the Diamondbacks were better. I'm just going to stick with it, and maybe I'm being optimistic, but I'm seeing a rotation that is going to unfold. Right, um, Jordan Montgomery makes his first start, I think, Friday against Blake Snell. or Maybe it's Saturday, but it's this upcoming oh, weekend. Oh, the Borisov, that's fun. Yeah, exactly, the <laughs> Borisov, that's a good one. So, And that rotation is going to look like Gallon, Kelly, Jamont, Fott, and then a combination of Ryan Nelson, Tommy Henry, or Eduardo Rodriguez. That's a really tough rotation. Do I think Corbin Carroll's going to have a 640 OPS moving forward? No. Right? And there's a couple more bats in their lineup. Ketel Marte is standing on his freaking head. The, the only way the Dimebacks have been scoring lately is due to Ketel Marte. But Jock Peterson looks good. Christian Walker has been slow. Like Gabby Moreno is off to a slow start. There's just a couple of bats in the lineup that I expect to be a little bit better, and the rotation is still good, still without Paul Seawald. And Joe Musgrove has been struggling. Like, I, But Michael King looked great. I think these two teams are going to be neck and neck. I, screw, I said going into the year buying into the Giants early. I mean, what was I doing there? But it's <laughs> definitely between the Diamondbacks and the Padres right now. I'm going to stick with the Diamondbacks. I still think they're better. 
I said going into the year, I thought the Padres bullpen would sneakily be one of the best in baseball. And you know, I think they're kind of living up to it for the most part. I mean, they've been great. You got Suarez looking like Suarez again. Uh, Peralta's got a sub one. Yuki Matsui's got a sub one. And then Yel De Los Santos is at a 108. Like their back end of that bullpen is really, really good. Uh, and, and they've, they've got some pitching reinforcements and like Robbie Snelling could even get up at some point this year. He's been shoving in double a Adam Mazur has been shoving, shoving in double a, those are two really exciting prospects. And you know that they're going to add to, uh, I think the D backs will add also, but I think the, the Padres have more trade capital. Um, you're going to get Machado back at third Tyler Wade, just out of the lineup. Uh, like I, I, I just, I'm important. I'm signing up to the star power in San Diego. And, and I, I just, I like what they're doing and I'm buying into Cronenworth. I think he's mm-hmm. kind of refreshed, restarted and, and looks a lot better. Yeah. Cease and King. Jeez. Cease and King is the difference for me. Like Dylan Cease and Michael King looking as good as they did this week that, that put them over the top for me, but I'm curious to see how Jamont looks reminder that that guy was not at a complex during spring training. Like such is the burden with Scott Boris clients in 2024. hundred percent. I think it's going to be a fight to the end with a lot of these teams. That's why I wanted to bring them up, right? The, the margins are razor thin. Um, so now I think it's time for the top five hitters of the week. Ready? So the top five hitters of the week are brought to us by Outlier, which is a sports betting decision assistant for aspiring intermediate and advanced sports bettors who understand that data is the foundation of a profitable sports betting strategy. Outlier pairs hyper-contextual and relevant sports data with available betting markets. Unlike traditional sports data with sites like ESPN and Baseball Reference, what Outlier does is they organize and visualize data for easy comprehension. That's why we want it. Efficient decision-making and immediate execution. You want to make good decisions and you want to make them quickly. That's what Outlier helps. And make sure to check out their first of its kind strike zone heat maps and pitch arsenal roundups that allow you to quickly visualize pitcher and batter matchups all in one screen. It's available on iOS, desktop, and mobile browsers. Get your seven-day free trial in our episode description by clicking the link or go to outlier.bet backslash just baseball. And if they ask for the promo code, remember, it's always just baseball. So this is where I find all of the hottest hitters of the week. Do you guys want to guess who they are? Or should I just give them to you? From this week. From this week. From the standpoint of like OPS. It's it's WRC so plus. the way I the way I found all of them was a combination of WRC plus war, batting average, home runs, and I just picked, and it was especially using outlier, they put it all in one thing. I just picked five who I thought had the best week. Okay. So it's not just like a rank of individual ones. Mike Trout has to be. Mike Trout ended up being six. Okay. Mike Trout ended up being six. So he didn't quite make my top five. Okay. Uh, divisions. Give us divisions. You know what's funny? Four of them are in the American League East. Three of them are on the same team. Um, is it bald? Is Kowser one of them? Like Kowser hit a divot, but Kowser even still last week slashing 385, 429, 923 with a 280 WRC plus one of two with a 0.8 F war this week. Gunner came in at number three, basically the same thing as Colton Kowser, just destroying baseballs. So also has four home runs, stole a bag, 0.7 F war. Gunnar Henderson came in at three. So we got Kowser at two. We got Gunnar at three. And you still have One AL West Oriole. and two AL East with another Oriole. Another Oriole is either O'Hearn or it's, I mean, Mullins just hit a walk-off nuke. Jordan I Westberg has been going it's crazy. Westberg. It's Westberg. Yep. It's Jordan Westberg. Jordan Let's Westberg, go. two bombs, two steals, walking a ton, hitting 423 with a 253 WRC+. plus. 0.7 F4. So now you're missing two. An AL West player and an AL East player not on the Orioles. So you got all the Orioles. Marcelo Zuna. Marcelo Zuna is not here. No, AL West and AL East. Oh, he said AL West and AL East. Shoot. Marcelo Zuna was in the top 10, though. So that was a good guess. It, Soto's got to be in there, right? Soto was not in here. Oh. Not a Yankee either. It's a Blue Jay. Oh, it's a Blue Jay. Highest WRC plus of the week. Is it Dalton Varsho? It is Dalton Varsho. Welcome back. 
four bombs for Dalton Varsho. That's why he's slugging 1118 with a 327 WRC plus. Love. That feels love. Really, Good to see Dalton really Varsho good. come back. 100%. Yeah, God, I would, you know, I, that's one where it's like you always want the trades to be like even. Um, when we're watching Michael Bush go crazy, like it's nice because I know that Cubs fans are very tapped into prospects and watching their prospects ball ball out for the Dodger system now. And like, it, it's just cool to see the win wins, but it was ugly when Moreno's playing in the world series and Varsho's stinking it up. So uh, and I mean, we know how talented out. he is. Yeah. yeah. And Korea. <laughs> yeah, <him> too. <laughs> so Don Varsho's four, you guys are forgetting number one, number one. And it's AL West, AL West, AL West. He is one of two Ruiz players. Call up. <laughs> yeah, he's one of two players with a 0 0.8 F war this week. In a week? Yeah. Ayo West. It. Who's that? Who's that little fucker that just always hits? Oh, oh. he's hitting 400. Yep. <laughs> Jose, Al Jose Altuve is hitting 467. He's your hottest hitter of the week. 467 batting average, walking almost as much as he's striking out. 277 WRC plus. 0.8 F4, multiple bombs, multiple steals in just a seven game span. Cooperstown. 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 Yeah, he's just never going to slow down. Huh? He's the man. I used to hate him. I love him now. I like he's the man. Yeah. I, I, I hope I hope people co will continue to come around. Like, as he just puts up numbers and we get further away from the whole the whole debacle uh, and just realize that it's just appreciate one of the best second basemen ever play the game. But the fact that he's still performing as one of the best players in baseball is just, just crazy. Yeah. Banger right. of an episode. Oh, games, games of the, of the week. week. We're not even Real done quick. yet. Games of the games week. Of the Let's week. do it. But this is going to be quick. Uh, Friday at 220. Today at 220. Shota Imanaga gets the ball at Wrigley against the Miami Marlins and Cubs. Jesus Lizardo. Cubs. Cubs. Who turns in the better start? Shota. Okay. I think Lizardo bounces back, has his best of the year, but Shota. Shota. Okay. Crochet and Turnbull in Philly at 640 Ooh. tomorrow. I'm not asking you for a winner. Spencer Under. Turnbull's ERA is at 180. Is Spencer Turnbull's ERA higher or lower than 180 by the end of his start? So, so does basically, does up, he, does does he, he throw a shutout? <laughs> you know what? I'm going lower. <laughs> yeah. does. I'm going to go marginally higher, but I actually think he, he shoves again. Six shutouts in 16 games, dude. The White Sox and the Brooklyn Super Boss in 1906. Um, oh, oh, Verlander no. makes his oh, return. God, I know. In 1906? That... Yes. Verlander in Houston against Mackenzie Gore, who's been throwing well. Mm. Verlander's gotten roughed up twice. Oh, yeah. Who wins? Feels like an over. Mackenzie Gore. I think. Welcome to the Astros. But at the same time, Astros offense has not been hitting, so. I, I watched the uh, Verlander uh, rehab start in double-A Frisco. I mean, he gave up five earned runs in double-A. I don't think he actually was – in his head, I don't know if he even saw hitters. I think he was legitimately throwing a bullpen, and then whatever happened, happened. Like, I, there were so many pitches where, like, it just seemed like he, he had minimal intent. Like, he was just trying to work up the pitch count, mix his pitches in. He threw a lot of middle-middle fastballs. I don't think he really cared. I think he bounces back and throws well. Hmm. Yeah, I'll go with the Astros. Friday at 840 in Denver, Emerson Hancock and the Mariners against Dakota Hudson and the Rockies. How many total runs? I'm not, I, I'm dead ass not kidding. I'm being 100% serious. 23. 23. I think Dakota Hudson pitches reasonably <laughs> well. I think he's meant for Coors, dude. I think, and the Mariners can't hit anybody. Yeah, that's the thing. The Mariners can't hit anybody. And Dakota Hudson is just going to be one of those classic, well, the Mariners just grounded out again into the double play after Dakota Hudson allowed two walks out of the inning. And Emerson Hancock, young pitcher, and Coors, good luck. I'm probably going to bet the Rockies' money line on that one. It's going to be an ugly game. I'll probably lose, but I think it'll be worth it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jays Padres in San Diego tonight at 940. Yariel Rodriguez against Matt Waldron. Mm. I don't know what to Jays. do. Jays. I don't know what to do with that damn knuckleballer. He's kind of good. Padres. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I'm going with the Padres too. I, I like Waldron sort of. I don't know if I do, but I, I like watching him. I don't know yes. if I think he's good, but I like watching him. All right. And then tonight at 10 15, the Boris Bowl, Jordan Montgomery <laughs> against Blake Snell, Montgomery season debut. How many cumulative innings from the starting pitchers? Eight. Ooh. 
I go six and two thirds. <laughs> you know, I was gonna, I'll cut the difference and say seven. I mean, I don't think Jaymont Jaymont probably goes five at most, and that's if he's carving. And Blake Snell is gonna go five. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I think anywhere between seven and ten is probably an accurate projection. I'll go with the. Ugh, I'll go with the Giants, even though you got to go quicker wrong. than this, man. You yeah, have I'll, to. Speed I'll go up. Giants. I'll go Giants. Got to go quicker. Uh, Saturday at two twenty, Edward Cabrera, Javier Assad. Pitchers duel. Pitchers duel. Edward Cabrera, Javier Assad. Edward Cabrera's coming off a good outing. Bad outing. Inbound. Give me the Cubs. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm interested to see how he bounces back off of it, but or, or if he can extend off of it. But Assad's a walking quality, quality start. Cubs. 405 in Pittsburgh. Cutter Crawford against Mitch Keller. Cutter. I'm taking the Red Sox. They're just rolling. Cutter's been awesome. I think okay. pitcher's duel. I think Keller has a nice outing. How about Yankees Rays in New York at 105 on Saturday? Zach Eflin against Nestor Cortez. Mm. Yankees. Why not? Why not? Right. Rays start to come alive a little bit, maybe. Not against the Bronx <laughs> Bombers. <laughs> I can see it. I can see uh, it. Seven ten on Saturday in Kansas City. Corbin Burns and the Orioles against Cole Reagans and the Royals. Ooh. Game of the weekend. Ooh. Um. Orioles are three and zero oh when Corbin Burns pitches. Give me the Orioles. I think Royals upset. I give me the Royals upset. Yeah, mm, I don't mind that either. Either this could be a sick left-hander, love left-hander, kind of carving up that lineup a little bit can get a little lefty heavy. I, yep. I, I think Royals surprise. I can see I like it. it. Uh, Seven twenty on Saturday, Nathan Uvaldi against Charlie Morton in Atlanta. I'll go Braves. Morton. Yeah, ah, uh, Morton's been shaky. I'll go with uh, I'll go with the Rangers. Mm, who Uvaldi? Uvaldi. Yeah, never mind. I'll go with the Rangers. Okay. And then on Sunday, one game that I want to point out, Astros Nats, 135 in DC, Christian Javier against Mitchell Parker. Yeah, After welcome. After a solid first start. Let's see if he can do it again. Give me the Astros. Yeah, I I actually think Parker's going to continue to be solid. Uh but this is a tough matchup and I think that they're going to be they're going to grind him out. Uh the goes will be a little bit of a welcome to the big leagues for Parker. All right, I lied one more. 310 on Sunday in Denver. George Kirby, Cal Quantrill. Rockies for sure. Yeah, it sounds like that one's already a wrap. <laughs> yeah, it's already ended. Yeah. One nothing. Yeah. One nothing <laughs> Rockies. One nothing. There we go. Do the merch. All right, folks, go get yourself some just baseball merch. I'm rocking. Always rocking. Arms rocking his hat. Guess who's not? Nope, that doesn't count, Jack. Don't be like Jack and go get your Just Baseball merch in the episode description. We got all new merch. Arm, tell them about the new merch. Uh, we got a whole new drop. Clay's crushing it. Uh, we've got a whole merch team now. We got a bunch of new stuff, uh, different types of sweaters, def- different kinds of jackets, shirts, athletic tees, polo, like everything. Go check it out. Tell us what you like, what you don't like. And uh, it would keep checking it out because we're going to be refreshing the store pretty much every few weeks with new stuff. Make sure to go check that out in the episode description and support all of the partners, whatever you like to do. Do you like to gamble? Do you like data? Do you like to go to games? What do you like? We got it all. Do you like gambling? Bet MGM, Code Just Baseball. You want to hit a game? Code Just Baseball on game time. You want to look at some, into some stats? Outlier, Code Just Baseball. All of them you can find in the episode description. And the best way to support this, if you don't want to spend a dime and you don't want to support our partners, kind of mean, but it's okay. As long as you rate and review five stars, whether that be on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts, and leaving a written review is always super, super helpful. And hit that big red subscribe button on YouTube. You know why? We're almost at 15,000 subscribers. Let's get up to that mark, folks. Thank you for pressing that big red button and keep pressing it more, please. For Jack McMullen, that's Arm Lane, and I'm Peter Apple. We'll be back on Monday. And with that, thank you, everybody. <laughs>